Alright y'all, it's your old friend Archie Gamble coming at you late at night after 2 a.m. on a Saturday evening, Sunday morning. And uh, I was inspired to post, film and post another uh, vlog. In fact, specifically another a picture's worth a thousand words format vlog. Something I experimented with and enjoyed the outcome. Some of you seem to too. And essentially what it comes down to is just taking a, a picture from the thousands I have over the 40 years of touring and recording and performing and writing and so on in the music industry and giving uh, the backstory to the picture in context. And uh, I try to pick the most fun pictures. So that said, please keep in mind that this picture is very much one of those. You see, I'm actually in my PJs, ready for bed, hair tied back and ready to rock. And I may have had a couple of drinks this evening. Maybe. Uh, certainly not enough to uh, impair my decision making, but enough to make me feel a little loose to want to share the following picture and story. So without any further ado, here it is. A picture's worth a thousand words. Okay, I'm going to insert the picture right... Shocking, I know. A picture of me, semi-nude in public. I say that with my tongue firmly planted on my cheek because those of you that know me will remember that I used to have a penchant for uh, doing such things in my younger years. I'm probably 20 pounds lighter and about 200 feet braver, if that makes sense. What was the old saying? Uh, seven feet tall and bulletproof. When it came to certain things, I had no gumption whatsoever about uh, dropping trial and having some fun. Of course, you know, if you have to do it and uh, look at it in context, it was never an inappropriate situation as far as there were no children around or seniors or anyone that might be offended. And it was all done in the spirit of good fun. But that said, yeah, I did have a tendency back then, I did have a tendency to. Uh, be a bit of an exhibitionist in public on the road. Oh, just in the spirit of rock and roll and having a good time. And as a matter of fact, I will confide and say that I have a picture of me at every Canadian provincial border crossing, naked or, or almost naked, pants down. I don't know, it seems like a good idea at the time. Uh, actually, ironically, the only one that I don't have is the province of Newfoundland because it's an island. We drove around one night after a gig, drunk out of our minds, trying to find a sign to welcome to Newfoundland. There's no border to cross, land border, so we weren't successful. At any rate, back to this picture. So, what you see here is uh, <laughs> me on Sulphur Mountain in Bath, the middle of the day, beautiful day, summer's day. Um, and I was on tour and playing a band uh, with the Kiss Tribute Band Alive, the band that I played with for a number of years from here in London, Ontario. And at the time, one of the very first professional Kiss Tribute bands, and for a long period of time, the best around. It had nothing to do with me. The guys had uh, firmly established that foothold before I ever joined. So what you're seeing is a day trip um, if I remember correctly, we played at a down defunct bar called Wild Bills in Banff, which was a great venue, uh, great big stage, and good production, and uh, that was fun. So, as a matter of fact, we played there, and the stage used to be at the far end of the club when you walked in. And then I remember latter years before it closed, I played, they moved it to the side of the room. But I digress, as I tend to do. So, essentially what happened was, uh, on tours like that, you would often have a hard time filling up Sunday to Wednesday nights, especially with a, a band like Alive that was a one-nighter concert production and clubs. That was a fairly expensive buy for promoters. But given the agents do, they typically would have most dates filled up, but occasionally we'd have a Sunday, Monday, or a Monday, Tuesday off. So I remember this was the case in Banff. Now I had been out there already with a few bands, uh, and knew what to expect. And uh, I believe it might have been actually my idea to contact the club and ask them 
if we could use or rent the van house that they owned in Banff. Nice little house just off the main strip because we had done so before with, uh, I'd done so before on Joe with Buffalo Brothers. So I believe that I contacted someone there and said, you know, do you remember me? And we have a couple of days off. Could we rent your uh, band house and just be tourists for a couple of days? And to their credit, they said, yes. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe they were nice enough to give it to us for free and ask that we leave money to tip the, the house cleaners when we eventually did check out, which we did do. So we had a couple of days off in the beautiful town of Banff, Alberta, right in the Rocky Mountains. For those of you who have been, you know, well, look at the, in the picture, look at the scenery around me, other than me naked, it's quite gorgeous. So there was a lot of stuff to do. And uh, the picture shows uh, us up at, well, pardon me, shows me at the top of uh, Sulphur Mountain. But there are other pictures, and I'll see if I can find them and insert them of all of us together, clothed, you know, just taking band shots and posing, having a great day. And to elaborate on this, I don't recall if it was the same day, but one of the days when we were in Banff, we also went out uh, horseback riding. And this is an interesting part of the story. I've never been on a horse in my life, with the exception of a pony when I was a child that bucked me. Oh, I won't even get into that. Um, so what had happened was, uh, for those that remember the, the, the band Alive, it was founded by uh, Spiro Papadatos, who later went on to work for Kiss, Gene Simmons specifically, and um, Steve and Dean George Coppolos, two of my best friends, great guys, brothers. Um, and uh, they also had the, the awesome uh, Steve Sakalis on drums when they formed, they were high school friends. They formed a Kiss tribute. And then Steve stepped aside for other things and I filled in for a few years. It was a great, great run. We actually did nine shows with Kiss on the Kiss convention tour in 1995. And um, a great experience all around. So what had happened was, the reason we went horseback riding was as follows. Um, on an earlier tour, we had been going up to Kingston, Ontario to do some shows. Matter of fact, it might, no, I don't think it was the same tour, but earlier on, we had a van and a nice double bed in the back, nice, you know, kind of interior, custom interior van and uh, travel comfortably. We attached a, a big U-Haul trailer to the van for the equipment. So what had happened was we were driving up to Kingston and there was a huge rainstorm. And uh, I'll never forget, we got to the venue and we unloaded the stuff. And I think it was a weekend of gigs. We would go out and do like um, Kingston, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City, like three or four shows in a weekend. Routing wise, they all make sense, right? So it was definitely Kingston, I remember that much. And we got to the venue pulled into the parking lot to unload, or the uh, back door or whatever it was at the venue. I think it was Stages in Kingston, or it might have been the other place that had the airplane, a light aircraft suspended from the uh, ceiling, but I don't remember the name of it. But the Stages gig was also a uh, sister club to Stages in Kitchener. Same logo, same layout and everything. And I digress again. But the point of the story is this, uh, when we got there, and opened up the back door of the trailer to unload the gear. I'll never forget, uh, the great Bungie Kovacs was guitar teching for us. They pulled out Steve's last Pauls, and literally a flood of water came out of the guitar case. They were submerged in water. There had been a leak in the trailer that caused the guitars, to, Steve's in particular, because where they were located near the back, to be filled up with water. They were submerged in water in the case. And he was just losing his mind, as he should be. I mean, he had uh, a smoking uh, tobacco burst, Les Paul, that had a uh, neck pickup routed out and a smoking pickup installed at a light. And, but, and he also had his beautiful, um, I think it was his Black Beauty 3 pickup Les Paul that this happened to, but don't quote me on this. 
uh, if it was that guitar, he had bought that from Sean Sanders, actually. Sean was a guitar player, singer in Buffalo Brothers. He bought that guitar. It was a 71 Black Beauty Les Paul, gorgeous guitar. He used part of his record company advance to buy that guitar and then sold it to Steve later. And further trivia, it had belonged to Michelle Wright's guitar player prior to Sean. If I can find it, I'll insert a picture of the guitar here. So, we get inside to the venue and literally dripping a, a stream of water from the cases. And then we'll open them up. We open them up, brother. We'll have a look. Like, oh boy, this doesn't look good. Now, to the eternal credit of Bungie Kovacs being the amazing tech that he is, he said, give me, give me some time. Let me see what I can do. And he somehow sourced a hairdryer and worked, set up his workbench, took the pickups out, took the back plate off, and went to work with a hairdryer, drying out as much as he could of the electronics and the pickups and the guitars, and managed to get it working for Showtime, which was incredible. Regardless, though, I mean, Steve, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, he was pretty pissed off, but he was always a pretty neutral, uh, gender, good-natured guy. And I remember saying to him, listen, you call you, you all, and you lose your shit on them. Because regardless of whether the fact the guitar is okay or not, this should not have happened. It could have gone the other way easily. And the fact that they rented you a trailer that leaked, you know, you need some compensation for this. And I wasn't in any way, shape, or form being, uh, trying to take advantage of the situation. You all should have paid. They put him in a very potentially dangerous situation. So I went with them to the call. You all, I'll never forget this. I wanted to coach him uh, and get to pay for it. He called the 1-800 number and he was telling me what was going on and, you know, getting progressively more angry. And I was goading him, like, feed it to them, give it to them. And, uh... They said, okay, well, we'll take your information and we'll investigate it. Which they did. Show went on, went great. So shortly after that, we went up to Western Canada to go on tour. And uh, this leads to where we are in Banff for a couple of days off. And I don't remember the time between the incident and, the, and this Banff trip. But he received a phone call. Oh, pardon me, he phoned, he phoned home to check in with his family, his mom and dad. And mom said, uh, someone from U-Haul called, called them back, no way to call back. Steve called back and I remember that he got off the phone, the you know, phone in the band house and he was pretty happy. He goes, hey, they uh, just offered me a really sizable settlement. It was a few thousand dollars. And I said, hey, that's great. You know, and slapping him on the back, congratulations and everything. And Steve, once again, one of the sweetest people I know, turned around and shared his, his uh, windfall with us. He said, well, listen, you know, well, let's go do something. Let's have a let's go horseback riding. It's on me. Which was really, really sweet of him to do. And uh, that's exactly what we did, you know. I don't think any of us had ever been on a horse before, but the whole band and crew, we went out to a stable that did tours of the base of the mountain and a little up. And uh, he paid for everyone. I believe at the time it might have been 75 or hundred dollars a person, which in 1990 money was quite a bit. And Steve was very generous and paid for everyone to go. We had a great time. I'll never forget being on these trails and looking down the horses did it multiple times a day. That's what she said. So they knew, instinctively knew the trails. And, you know, we were never unsafe. But it was a little scary because you would look down and if the horse had stepped, sidestep two or three feet, you would plunge several hundred feet down the side of an embankment. So it was a bit thrilling and it was a lot of fun. And that was one of the things that we did as tourists for a couple of days off the map. And of course, the other was taking the gondola up to Sulphur Mountain. Now, I don't know what overcame me. Well, I do know what overcame me. I was an idiot. Uh, and back then, I would drop my trousers at the, you know, drop of a hat. Mixed metaphors there, but you know what I'm trying to say. So, um, what had happened was we went up and we found a really picturesque spot. And it was off the trail. I'll never forget this because there was a trail and guardrails up. I said, do not go beyond this point. And of course, that's like a red flag to a bull with a rock band. That's exactly what we did. We climbed over the barricade and went down a little further than we were supposed to. 
found this perfect spot you can see by the picture with the mountains in the background and everything just some band shots which i hope to put in and uh and then i don't know what struck me but as weird the guys walked away i took off everything except for my shoes and socks my shorts my shirt well i'm only wearing shorts and a t-shirt and just the guys quick uh, uh zapped off a couple quick frames while laughing their balls off and literally i was just putting my clothes back on and a couple of little old ladies had decided to venture off the trail too and they literally just turned the corner as i'm putting my shirt on i'd already have my shorts on thankfully uh as a kind of bonus side story to this i seem to have very good luck with that sort of thing because um Another time we were in the studio with Steve and I had a project later on called Buddy uh, with Gord Pryor and Barry Donahue from, uh, Donahue rather, from uh, Blue Bones. Excellent band I'm still very proud of. But we were having, uh, we were in the studio with Dan Broadbeck and um, just trying to lighten the mood. One of the songs has had a real kind of loose rock and roll feel to it. So we just cut the rhythm tracks live. So I went into the room and I just took off all my clothes and played the take nude completely nude and we got it and we're all laughing and the same exact thing happened i was putting my clothes back on just as i put my clothes on Stephen dean's father showed up uh, uh mr angelo uh george coppola an amazing man uh, god love him he was both their parents were great and so supportive and so nice wonderful wonderful people but uh, he just walked in to the control room when i just put my clothes back on. So it was a close call. I think he probably would have uh, laughed. Anyway, he was a really funny man. Matter of fact, I can remember side story number two. He was Greek. Both his parents were from, from Greece. And uh, I remember him telling me once in his every accent in English, he said, he, I was standing up front waiting for the boys to come and load the van. It was just he and I, Mr. Mr. G, I called him. I was standing there and he said, Hey, Archie, you know. The Greek word for Archie is Ahili, and the Greek word for balls is Aphili. Now, I don't know that those were the exact words, I'm paraphrasing. And then he started laughing his ass off and walked away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was a pretty funny story. Anyway, I have to say, I look back on those days fondly uh, with the camaraderie of being on the road with friends, I miss that, and being young and then having the future be wide open. And being able sometimes to just be a little bit silly and, uh, you know, grab life by the balls. So, it was another uh, picture that tells a thousand words rock and roll story, and I hope you enjoyed it. And once again, please, if you can, like, comment, and subscribe. Rock and roll.